Yeah, thank you, Brother Harrison. Okay, well, it is um, my great honor and privilege today to bring up uh, Brother Daniel Kiniston. Uh, I've known him and his family for quite some time and have honestly been very blessed with, with just so much that I could, could speak of and, and, and boast on in their, in their, <laughs> in their behalf. Um, in particular today that I, I'm, I'm very blessed with is just the long-term missionary life that Brother Daniel and his family have, have done. I mean, as soon as after, before Brother Daniel was married, um, there at, uh, he would be taking tours as a young man to, to Ghana and to the mission field and organizing those types of a thing and just showed a burden for the lost and for missions at that time. And then shortly right after he was married, or right after he was married, literally went immediately into the mission field in Ghana and has been there for 24 years and uh, consistently. While he's been doing there, um, uh, he, as he's been there, he's also started a mission school called Sent One. Um, I've had the, the honor of having one of my children, Christian and Paulette, actually have both graduates of the Sent One school. It's a three-month school. Um, goes from September to, to December, and that's been there since 2007, and holding that and doing that's been, been great. I'll never forget um, when I picked up Christian from the airport after coming straight back from Sent One, the, the fire in his eyes that he had about the passion for the lost and, and the discussions that we had during that time was, was very impressive to me, and I was very blessed, and, and yeah, it's hard to get that out of your mind as a, as a father. They also they have something there that he started is a 20-month a uh, ministering intern program called SENT2, um, which they, they also operate there. And through all that, he, he, his, he and his, his lovely family, Christy and his family there, have been doing that in homeschooling and, and all those things. And so many times after the talk today, from so many different levels, from, from how, do you, have you, how do you be a family on the mission field? How do you homeschool? How do you do these different things? Uh, he's done that for years and done it with a passion and a fire for Christ that still inspires me when I, when I hear him sing, uh, when I hear him singing, amen, when I hear him preaching and talking. We've used him, uh, we've been just ringing out, I'm sorry he's going to be wore out as he gets back to his poor family after all this, but we've had him about every moment and all the different things, but it's a, it's a great honor and a blessing to have you. We bring up here and I'll pray with you here and um, we'll hear from our brother Daniel. Let's pray. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, it's such an honor to have Brother Daniel here today, and I just ask your grace and anointing to be upon him. I pray, oh God, that there, all of us, as we sit here and listening to this message, that we wouldn't just hear this on an academic level today, Lord, but that you would speak to our hearts and that you would inspire us, Lord, to truly expand your kingdom and to bring glory to you more and more and more. So, Lord, please give him words. Please give us listening ears and you be glorified in what we do here today. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share with you all today. I'm, um, I'm a preacher, that's who I am, and I'm here to teach a couple of classes, and now this is called a Sattler talk. Amen. So I, I hope that it's okay if the talk gets a little bit um, passionate. That's who I am. <clears throat> One of my favorite um, word pictures for cross-cultural ministry people are, uh, comes from a book on cross-cultural mission work called The Incarnational Approach to Missions. And um, it uses the picture of a 150% person for, to, to depict what it's like to be a cross-cultural missionary. Um, the example there is that Jesus was a 200% person, fully God and fully man. He did not lose any of his godlikeness when he came to this earth, but when he was here on this earth, he was 100% a man. And if you would have encountered him specifically uh, before his earthly ministry was started, you would have seen a Jewish carpenter and not known that you were seeing the Son of God. Obviously, a missionary is never going to be 100% uh, the country that he chooses to live in and minister in, but the thought that we can be a little bit more than a 100% person through cross-cultural work 
um, I think is a beautiful example. Being a 150% person means that when you are in either country, the one that you grew up in or the one that God has called you to work in, you're only 75% of whatever you were in that country. So I've given up something to become an African man. And so when I'm here in this context, my cross-cultural awareness is just like it is when I'm in Africa, trying to see what everybody is doing. Does everybody still have their shoes on? How do they greet here? What is appropriate? But I have really enjoyed interacting with you all for these um, couple of days and trust that we can be a blessing to you that we won't make any cultural faux pas that will stop you from receiving what uh, God wants to minister through us. I'd like to share with you today a message on this um, topic, All Cuddles and No Commission. And I, I hope that that uh, title gave you some, um, some interest, maybe as you saw that title out ahead. I'd like to start with a question for you, just to get us thinking down the, the line of what we'd like to share today. This is the question, is the church the bride of Christ? Is the church the bride of Christ? Just think about that. <clears throat> turn with me, we're just gonna let that question sit. Mark chapter 13, Mark chapter three rather, turn with me there to Mark chapter three. Jesus is choosing his disciples and ordaining them, and we're going to start reading from Mark chapter 3 and verse 13. And he goeth up into a mountain, and calleth unto him whom he would, and they came unto him. And he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that he should send them forth to preach, and to have power to heal sicknesses, and to cast out devils. I want us to look carefully at um, the purpose of Jesus in calling out his disciples. It says that he went up into a mountain and then he called to him the people that he wanted to have come to him. They came there and he chose 12 from among them. I don't know exactly how many people came up into the mountain, but the Bible says that he chose 12 and he ordained them that they should be with him. I think that would be a wonderful ordination, to be ordained by Christ, to be one of the 12 that was going to be with him. Now, I think being chosen to be one of the 12, to be with Christ, would not have been an easy thing. They had to leave everything, leave their nets, leave their tax collector's booth, leave their employment, leave their families, and follow Christ. But the Bible says that Jesus called those 12 to be with him, and for a secondary purpose, and that he might send them forth to preach. And not in this Bible that I'm using today, but in, in the Bible that I had when I was a young man, there just happened to be a page turn in between, and he ordained the 12 that they might be with him. End of page. Turn the page, just by chance. Turn the page, and it says, and that he might send them forth. That page turn was significant to me as a young man as I studied this because I thought to myself that many of us are willing to be called to Jesus, willing to be ordained to be with him, but not willing to be ordained to be sent out. And when I use the word ordained, I'm just using it because it's in the King James Bible. I'm not referring to a pastoral ordination. Jesus chose the 12 and he called them to him but Jesus' calling of the disciples to him had a secondary purpose, or maybe a primary purpose. The purpose that Jesus brought them to himself was so that they could be trained and then sent out again. And I wonder, since it was a, a turning of the page for me in, in my edition of the Bible, I wonder if it was possible that some of the disciples thought they were being called to be with Jesus, but didn't realize that they were being called to be sent forth. Can you imagine what it would have been like to just go around with Jesus, trail along with him, yes, serve him in a few ways, but be there to witness the miracles? I mean, 
I would love to have been among those who got to share out the loaves and fishes to the multitudes. I would have loved to be there to see a blind man receive his sight. I mean, I, I, I've witnessed uh, on video, my children were watching um, a doctor who does surgery for people who are blind. I think this was in Nepal. And the, the amazing moment when they take off the bandages on the eyes of these dear people who haven't seen for many years and they see the face of the doctor for the first time. I was moved to tears just watching it. Can you imagine what it would have been like to be there with Jesus and Jesus restores the sight? What about when Jesus raised the, the widow's son back to life again? I mean, can you imagine? Jesus called the 12 that they might be with him. But Jesus' purpose in bringing the 12 to be with him was that so that by being with him, they would learn something from him. He would train them. He would equip them. He would give them his worldview. And then he would send them forth. And sometimes I wonder if we haven't focused more on being called to Jesus and less on being sent forth from Jesus. I wonder if the context of our American Christianity because life is comfortable for us and, and, and life in America or North America, I realize there are Canadians here, life in North America is it, it's just going well. We're doing well. And so that has put a focus on, that has placed a focus in our spiritual lives on being with Christ and not very much focus on the fact that Christ will want to send us away. I wonder what it was like the first time that Jesus sent the disciples away. I don't know how long they were with Jesus, but, you know, just with him every day, just with him in his presence, experiencing him, listening to his words, enjoying being with him. I imagine, not I imagine, I know on the authority of God's word that Jesus would have been the most incredible um, living love that you could have ever imagined. I mean, if you know a person who's like, that person is just wonderful to be around. They, they really know how to build a relationship. They, they really lift me up. I feel encouraged when I'm with them. There's no way that your best friend or best encourager in your life could be more than what Jesus was. So the disciples lived with Jesus in that wonderful relationship. And then came the day that Jesus said, I'm going to send you out. I thought we were ordained to be with you. No, you ordained so that you would be with me and that I can send you forth. Luke, please turn over to Luke chapter 8. We're breaking into the middle of a familiar story here. The man that Jesus delivered from the legion of devils. We're breaking in at verse 35. Then they went out to see what was done, and they came to Jesus and found the man, out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. They also which saw it told them by what means he that was possessed of the devils was healed. Then the whole multitude of the country of the Gadarenes round about besought him to depart from them, for they were taken with great fear. And he went up into the ship and returned back again. Verse 38. Now the man out of whom the devils were departed besought him that he might be with him. Let's just stop there for a moment. Can, can you understand why a man who has just been healed a man who has lived in chains and, and roamed the earth and been a social outcast and, and uh, hurt himself on a daily basis. And now he encounters the Son of God who comes up to him and within a couple of moments delivers him. And then just, I don't know, an hour later, the people come up and meet Jesus and this former demoniac. And he's sitting there at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And now the people of the community, strangely enough, are more afraid of the healer than they were of this man who's been living there in the graveyard for all those years. And they ask Jesus to leave, and, and Jesus leaves. And as Jesus is about to leave, this man that Jesus has just healed begs, desires, longingly pleads, I want to be with you. Does that make sense? 
I think every single one of us would, would, would have the same um, heart desire if we had just met Jesus and Jesus had just healed us from all those demons. Obviously, his theology probably wasn't very mature. He had just, just met Christ, and here I've just met this man, and by meeting this man, all these demons are gone out of my life. The best thing I could possibly do would be to stay with this man whose presence has wrought such an incredible miracle in my life. And he besought him that he might be with him. I think that's understandable. But look at the next words. But Jesus sent him away. Please, in no way do I want any of us to think evil of what Jesus did here. Jesus is the Son of God, his his wisdom and his plans and his purposes for his glory are perfect. But it's okay for us to be just a little bit jolted by that. But Jesus sent him away. Really? There must have been some incredible purpose. There must have been some very important reason. There must have been a very important task. Otherwise, why would it make sense for Jesus to send away this person who has just been healed and is now sitting at his feet and wanting to be in his presence? What was that work? What could possibly be important enough that Jesus would send him away? Jesus sent him away saying, return to thine own house and show how great things God hath done unto thee. Jesus sent him away. I want you to leave now. I'm getting on the boat. I'm going back across the, the, the sea, and I want you to leave. But I don't just want you to leave because for some reason I don't want you around me. Not that at all. I want you to leave because I want you to go back to the area where you are well known because in the place where you are well known, your testimony will bring me glory. I want you to go and show with your life, the great things that God has done unto you. You know, that man didn't even need to open his mouth. He didn't need to start preaching. His life showed. All he needed to do was walk down the streets of his hometown. Everywhere he went, his life showed the great things that Jesus had done for him. The Bible records that he obeyed, and he went his way and published that's kind of an old English word in that usage, but it's a word we're still using today, published. He set up the first publishing house. It was his life. He published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. You know, the city where he lived, where everybody knew him as, sorry, in Africa we call them crazy men. Everywhere he went, people knew him as the former madman, the former demoniac. He was able to publish through the whole city simply by walking. Just walk. Walk the streets. Say good morning to people. How you doing? Are, are you John? Yes, I'm John. It, John that used to live down? Yeah, yes, that's, that's John. He published the great things that God had done for him. In both of these, we're highlighting the fact that Jesus sent these people away from him because he had a purpose for their life. And I realize that you and I are now living in the spiritual presence of Jesus. We live with the indwelling Holy Spirit in us, and we don't have the privilege right now of living with Christ in a physical body, physical way, and neither do we have the responsibility or neither do we have the requirement that we walk away from Christ's presence in order to go and do the work that God has called us to. But I'm using this to highlight the fact that I believe American Christianity has gotten imbalanced on a desire to spend our time cuddling with Jesus rather than obeying his commission. I'm not talking physically about sitting on a couch with Jesus because Jesus doesn't sit on a couch, but I'm speaking about in our hearts and our minds and our approach to our Christian life, are we looking for cuddles or are we willing to obey a commission?
the first question I asked you, is the church the bride of Christ? That was a little bit of a trick question. The church is going to be the bride of Christ. The church is not now the bride of Christ. The church is now the espoused bride. We are the promised one. We are the fiancé, if you want to use the modern uh, French-English term, I believe. We're not yet the bride of Christ. Are you with me on that? You understand what I mean by that? We're not yet the bride of Christ. We are espoused. 2 Corinthians 11. I believe there is a monumental difference between the lifestyle of an espoused bride and a bride. And I think that sometimes the church thinks that we're on our honeymoon, and I think our bridegroom is waiting for us to do the work that an espoused bride is supposed to do. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. Well, let's read verse 1. Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, verse 2, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That's Paul speaking. Roll all the way forward into the book of Revelations, and this is prophetic now. We're in Revelations chapter 19 and verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Maybe what I just su suggested to you is a little bit of a new idea. We're not the bride, we're the espoused bride. But think about it. We are yet to be returned or yet to be reunited with our espoused groom. And the day is coming when he will return for us. And when he comes back for us, he's coming back for his bride. But we haven't gotten to that moment yet, which means that we are in the period where we are promised to him and waiting for his coming and waiting for that great wedding feast. What do espoused grooms do during the waiting period? Just think a little bit back to Jewish culture. I realize it's a little different now. Most of us, when we're waiting to get married, have to go find a, a house to rent. That would be kind of the way we do it now. But in the olden days, what do you think the responsibility was of the espoused groom while he got ready for the wedding? To prepare a place. And you're, 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 you're speaking that in, in biblical terms, and that's where we're going. John chapter 14, Jesus is speaking to the disciples, <clears throat> and he says to them in John chapter 14, verse 2, he says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Just think about it with me. A little bit of a mind exercise. Think about a fiancé, a female fiancé, and think about the work that goes into preparing for a wedding. Obviously, most of you here are not married. A few of you are. Weddings are a lot of work. It takes a lot of organization, a lot of preparation, whether you're sewing or you're ordering or you're cooking or you're organizing the cooking, you're sending out invitations, people are responding, people are asking questions. Sometimes there's lodging to work out, there's buildings to work out. Even a very simple wedding is a very involved thing to pull off. And that responsibility usually falls on the, on the fiancé, on the female who is waiting to be married. I'm thinking back to my uh, courtship and when I married my wife almost 25 years ago. 
I remember that when we got together on dates, we had things we had to do. There was work to do, you know? Like go through address lists. How many people are we going to invite? Do you have an updated address? This one came back. Now we need to send it here. There's too many people on this list. And it, that was actually quite a bit of work. And, and my wife and I didn't even, um, didn't even have a complex wedding. But there was still a lot of work to be done. Imagine if you, the young man, would go to meet your, your bride-to-be, and two weeks ago you gave her the invitations and you gave her the address list, and she's supposed to be sending out the invitations. And you sat with her and you chatted, you know, as lovebirds do. You kind of look at each other and look into each other's eyes. And, and then you said to her, hey, how is it going with mailing out those invitations? It's only four weeks from the uh, RSVP date. Have you sent those out? She said, oh, honey. <laughs> no, I'm just, look at me again, dear. <laughs> My wife and I were absolutely that Twitterpated. <laughs> okay, well, what have you been doing? Well, you know that eight by 10 you gave me? I just like to sit up there on my bed and look at that picture and think about you and what it's gonna be like to be married to you. And I just haven't been sending out the invitations. Did you and your mom find the, the material for the wedding dress yet? No, mom keeps bugging me about that, but I'm just looking at your picture. I think that would be really adorable one time. <laughs> but if the, as the weeks went by and you continued to realize this girl is just so in love that she can't think about the fact that we need to put a menu plan together and we need to send out the invitations and we need to get the dress ready and there are things we have to do. There are decisions we have to make. We can't just smile at each other and I think by the second time I as the groom-to-be would probably say dear I am so happy that you love me I'm so happy that you love looking at my picture I can't wait for us to be together but dear we're gonna take a honeymoon and I promise you I won't go anywhere we will be together unbroken we will do everything together you can look at me all day and all night if you wish but right now there are some things that I need you to do. And I firmly believe that American Christianity has fallen to the side of wanting to be in Christ's presence and making much out of his presence and making, elevating to a very high level the concept of worship and being with him which is not wrong as long as we realize that the time that we spend in his presence is supposed to prepare us, motivate us, and train us to fulfill the responsibilities that he's left us to fulfill. Our groom-to-be went away from the church. Jesus went up back to heaven, back to his Father. When he was going, he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when he was going, he said, I'm giving you a responsibility. I want you to go into all nations and preach this gospel in all places, all the way to the end of the earth. And then Jesus went up to heaven and the disciples stood there with their mouths open, looking up into heaven. And they stayed that way so long that God had to send an angel to tell them to close their mouths and get to work. He did. Finally, the angels come and said, um... This same Jesus that you just saw go, uh, he is coming back just like he promised. And I understood that he gave you a to-do list. How about starting on that? Uh, how about you start doing what he asked you to do? <clears throat> Some of you were in the class yesterday morning with Brother Caravilla. He asked me some questions. We sort of did an impromptu Q&A, and one of the questions he asked me was, what um, kind of bridge conversations have I found works well with Muslims? Because I live in a Muslim-majority city. And uh, I told the story briefly, for those of you that were not there, I told the story briefly of the fact that in Ghana, my people are so um, so friendly. Ghana is, is, is actually uh, ranked among the top five friendliest nations in the world. It just 
It is. They're very friendly. And I'm, I talked about the fact that within a few minutes with a, in a taxi, I can build a relationship with a taxi driver and then say, Omar, you and I are friends, right? And Omar will say, yes, we are best friends. And I'll say, you know, friends tell each other the truth, right? Oh, yes, friends would never lie to each other. And then I can say, you know, I'd, I'd like to share something with you about my faith in Jesus Christ. And I don't want to offend you, but we're friends, and I have to tell you the truth. And then on that basis, I'm able to open my mouth and share freely. I hope we're friends enough that I can speak the truth. I want to read to you the lyrics from two worship songs. I am not slamming these worship songs. I know these words. I've sang these songs. But I, I just want to bounce on the other side of the teeter-totter a little bit. You have lots of voices around you here in America who will continue to affirm American Christianity. But it's my opportunity to bring a different viewpoint. So if you will allow me to do that without, without thinking, well, that's not fair. He's not being, he's not being uh, fair to where we're at. Just allow me, please. And just think about that girl sitting on her bed, gazing at the picture of her beau instead of preparing for the wedding. This is a Michael W. Smith song. Draw me close to you, never let me go. I lay it all down again to hear you say that I'm your friend. You are my desire, nothing else will do because nothing else can take your place. To feel the warmth of your embrace, help me find the way, bring me back to you. You're all, I've, you're all I want, you're all I've ever needed. You're all I want. Help me know you are near. <clears throat> this is I Just Want to Be Where You Are by Don Moen. I just want to be where you are, dwelling in your presence. I don't want to worship from afar. Draw me near to where you are. I just want to be where you are, in your dwelling place, in your dwelling place forever. Take me to the place where you are, because I just want to be with you. I want to be where you are, dwelling in your presence, feasting at your table, surrounded by your glory. In your presence, that's where I always want to be. I just want to be, I just want to be. I just want to be with you. I realize this is a, a university and you all think deeply. So I'm sure that someone is, is thinking of the fact that, well, working for Christ doesn't mean leaving his presence. Thank God it doesn't. The Holy Spirit is God for the missionary age. Because in the missionary age, we can't all be around Christ. And so Jesus promised that his spirit would go with us. We're very familiar with Matthew 28, the Great Commission, which says, go ye into all the world. And then Jesus promises, I will be with you. The promise of his presence is meant to accompany our obedience to the command to go. So I know that it's possible for me to sing these songs in Africa and say, Lord, I just want to be near where you, where I just want to be with you. I want to be surrounded by your glory. I want to put my head on your chest like uh, John did. And I can sing that as a missionary in Africa. You can sing that as an American here. And both of us can experience the reality of God's presence. However, I feel that American Christianity needs a bump away from the cuddles and towards the commission. And that's where we got our title from. There's too much of a desire, I believe, to elevate the concept of us just being with Jesus. And we've come to associate the comforts of our Western society with the good Christian life and enjoying his presence. And then when Jesus says, I'm sorry, I'm sending you back to where you came from. I don't want you to just stay here with me. I want you to go and work for me. 
it sounds like it's something strange. It's like, why do I have to sacrifice? Why do I have to be uncomfortable? Why can't I just stay in the holy huddle? It's comfortable here. So I believe that the Lord Jesus calls us as his espoused bride to stay pure and holy. And you could preach a message on that. But we're also supposed to get ready for the wedding. And we're supposed to invite people to the wedding. And we're supposed to make sure that the wedding feast will be full. And he, our groom, is fulfilling his side. He's absolutely preparing a place for us. And he's planning to come back and take us so that we can be with him forever. Walking through the grass. I don't know what we're going to do. Laying our head on his shoulder. Witnessing the grandeur. Letting him show us his, his plan from beginning of creation. Letting him answer our questions. Us worshiping at his feet because we're just so overwhelmed by his holiness and his wisdom and his love for us that we can't do anything else but kneel there and worship. We're going to be with him. And we're going to be with him forever. But right now, we've been given a task. And I want to push you in the direction of enjoying his presence while fulfilling a task. Rather than seeking to stay in the lazy boy, enjoying his presence like some kind of a warm fuzzy. I think it's possible that our love for the Lord Jesus when we worship and when we pray, is it possible that our, our love sounds a little bit hollow if we're not ready to obey? Sometimes really disturbs me when I encounter modern day Christian worship and I realize that this, the words of this song seek to elevate and, and lift up and praise my King, King Jesus, and yet the people who are singing these songs and the way that they're performing these songs seem to just fly right in the face of what the Bible tells us about the character of God. And so I'm very uncomfortable with that. We're told to lift up holy hands, not just lift up hands. There's something to do. Our worship needs to fit the one that we're worshiping. And the one who we're worshiping is holy. And the one that we're worshiping is missionary. The one who we want to be with wants to send us forth. Thankfully, his presence goes with us through the Holy Spirit indwelling us. But he wants to send us forth and the going forth is awkward and the going forth is uncomfortable and the going forth entails suffering. But that's the work that he's leaving for us to do. An example from my childhood. When I was a boy, my father traveled a lot, preaching, traveling. He would fly all over the United States and Canada preaching. And there were young men in the church when I was growing up who really wanted to spend two hours with Brother Denny. My father was an extremely busy man. And they wanted to spend two hours with Brother Denny. And it was very difficult to get two hours with Brother Denny. It was just difficult. There were a lot of people. There were lines. There were people who wanted to see him. He couldn't reach around. But there were a couple of young men who found a little secret. They, they realized Brother Denny drives to Philadelphia, parks his car for four days, pays for parking, and then four days later comes back and drives back to Lancaster County. What about if I offered to drive Brother Denny to the airport and pick him up? And the first young man who, who came up with the idea, he got to do it repeatedly. My father just thought, this is such a sweet offer. But a few other young men caught on to it and realized, hey, I could have Brother Denny for four hours all the way there, or three hours, whatever it is, all the way there and all the way back. Hey, Brother Denny, when are you going to Philadelphia next time? They had found the secret of being in my father's presence. And please, I'm not trying to elevate him too high. It was my dad. I loved him. I miss him incredibly. But they realized if I go where he's going, I'll be with him. That seems really basic. 
But the guys who caught on to it were on to a secret. They had suddenly found the opportunity. Can you imagine going to church and saying, yeah, I had four hours with Brother Denny this week. You did? Are you marrying his daughter? How did you get four hours with <laughs> Brother Denny? Well, what did you do? How did you possibly get four hours? Well, I found out he was going to the airport at four in the morning, and so I got up at four in the morning, and I drove him there, and of course he sat beside me. That's what you do. And we talked. The Lord Jesus is on this, on this earth right now. The Lord Jesus is busy fulfilling his Father's eternal purposes. And he promises that when we go, he will be with us. Maybe we're trying to claim the promise without going. And maybe the promise is not being fulfilled in its fullest measure. I want to be careful. I don't want to fall into some theological pit here. But I do believe that the fullest measure of Christ's spirit is promised and is available and, and works most powerfully in the lives of those who obey his command. And so I would say to all of us, we, we look around modern day Christianity today and we realize that there's an awful lot that names the name of Christ which does not in any way measure up to the standard of God's word and, and we rightly critique that. But let's check ourselves and see whether our lives and our activity for Christ and our desire to work for his glory matches up to the standard of God's word. There is so much in the word of God about God's eternal plan to bring, to redeem the nations of the world back to himself. It is all through the scriptures. Are we matching up to the life of the God who we, who we say is our God and, and our King Jesus? And maybe you will discover the secret of his presence by deciding to go where he goes. Jesus said, why am I working? My father works hitherto and I work. It's a natural thing. My father's working and I have to work. Well, your father is working and you have to work. And I believe, metaphorically speaking, if you would get into the car and go where Jesus is going or get into the plane and go where he's going or get into the slums and minister where he's ministering, you would discover that his presence is there in an amazing way. But if we insist upon cuddles, I think we're only going to experience a very small part of the great uh, presence that, and blessing that Christ wants to pour into our lives. All cuddles, no commission. Jesus, I'm just here for the ordination to be with you. I'm not here for the ordination, please send me out. Please, please don't send me out. When we go away from you, we're in danger and, and some people laugh at us and we find challenges we don't know how to solve. Please don't send me away. And Jesus said, no, I ordained you so that you could be with me, but my time with you has a motivation that it will prepare you to be sent out. Are you just sitting on the bed looking at the picture of your bridegroom? Just, oh, can't imagine what marriage will be like. He wants you to worship him, but he wants you to worship him understanding that his eternal purpose has not yet been completed. And you and I are part of that eternal purpose. And there's an opportunity for our little insignificant lives to play a very significant role because we've aligned ourselves with his great plan for the world. And so to say, Lord Jesus, I look forward to being with you forever. I want to live in your unbroken presence. But I recognize that right now, you may want to send me out into a dying world. I think it's C.T. Studd who said, most want to live within the sound of church and steeple bell, something like that. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. You will find Christ's presence in the dark places that need the gospel, but they won't be as cuddly. 
And so I'm encouraging you today to orient yourselves as you prepare for the life that God has called you to and as you're here preparing for whatever God has for your life. I want to encourage you to orient your spiritual life away from cuddles and towards a life of worship that, that gives glory to God by letting him direct where he wants me to go and what he wants me to do. One more song. You may know this, and if you do, feel free to sing along. But if not, just think about the words in the context of what, we're, what we've discussed today. <clears throat> there is peace and contentment in my Father's house today. Lots of food on the table and no one is turned away. There is singing and laughter as the hours pass by, but a hush calms the singing as the Father sadly cries. My house is full, but my field is empty. Who will go and work for me today? It seems my children all want to stay around my table. No one wants to work in my field. No one wants to work in my field. Push away from the table. Look out through the window pane. Just beyond this house of plenty, lies a field of golden grain and it's ripe unto harvest but the reapers where are they in the house oh can't the children hear the father sadly say my house is full but my field is empty. Who will go and work for me today? It seems my children all want to stay around my table. No one wants to work in my field. No to work in my field. I do believe that that correctly expresses the heart of the Lord Jesus on days when we just want to sit around the table. We just want to be with him. I urge you to ask God to open your eyes because I think if you open your eyes and tune in, you'll realize that while your father keeps coming back to the table and, 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 and laughing a little bit and smiling at the children, he has a heart of burden and desire and longing. Jesus said, other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. So I think if you tune in, you'll realize your father's happy to have you around the table. But he's still longing for those other sheep. And you would bring a very special delight to your father. If in one of those moments when you realize that he's got his eye on a field over there, you would stand up like Isaiah and say, Here I am, Lord. Send me. Is there something out there? Is there something you'd like me to do? Is there somebody you'd like me to bring in? I think you would bring a special delight 
to the heart of your father because you were close enough to realize that while he's happy around the table, he's not fully happy. There are still people, souls that he is longing to bring. And once they're all in, then it'll be marriage and the supper and all eternity together with him. And then there'll be no more looking out, longing for others to come. But we're not there yet. Let's tune into the heart of our Father and ask him for the commission. Yes, Lord Jesus, I'm here for your presence, but I'm also here to be sent. Send me. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for speaking to our hearts this morning, this afternoon. Thank you for these young people and their desire to prepare for a life of serving you in various capacities. Father, I pray that through these few words that we have shared, you would tune their hearts more to your heart, that they would realize that their father still cares about the children who are outside, that their father, while happy to be around the table with these children, is still longing for others to be brought in. Lord, fill my heart and their hearts with a desire to be useful to you, not just cuddle, but to obey the commission that you have given to us. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brother Daniel. That's a very stirring call to obey the Lord. It, it reminds me of a, uh, a sermon I read uh, years ago by Hudson Taylor's grandson. It was uh, Hudson Taylor III. And he was talking about on the scripture about go into all the world, the Matthew 28 commission. And the name of the sermon was simply, no go, no low. And we want the low, he'll be with us to the end of the age, but Hudson Taylor III put it in the sense that it comes with a condition to go to all the world. And so I, I greatly appreciate this challenge and this, this picture that you've given to us. I, I was one of those young men that found every moment to be with your father. And um, I remembered that analogy and the way you, you described it there about being about the work of Christ and what his passion is and what he's interested in. Um, I thought of that. And there's a, there's a curious statement your father said to me once that it's almost kind of a joke in our household. <laughs> and it's still, I, I was talking about how incredibly busy he was. And he said, Dean, my life is full of people and you're just one of them. <laughs> and Tanya and I kind of joking, we'll, you'll, we'll, we'll say this every now and then, but it went with this that he was always so about the kingdom. And the analogy takes that when we're about that service, when we're about the emphasis of the passion of what God is wanting to do, um, this is part of that. So I, I greatly appreciate those analogies and those thoughts. And um, I pray that God would just let that sink into each of us as we talk about how we can truly glorify and, and worship God in the way that he wants us to. Well, praise the Lord. Well, it's such a holy hush, I hate to even break it, but we're going we're gonna to break here, and then I believe go to the other side. Is that right, Brother Harrison? And, um, and then he's going to be open for a, a, more talk, <laughs> for questions and answers from both missionary life, long-term missionary life, both girls and guys alone, uh, I mean, uh, uh, together can, can ask these different types of different questions that you have to bring to him. Feel free. And then after that, I think we're going to or is that it? Or then also into the missionary class, uh, we're going to get every last minute with him. Um, uh, we're going to do the uh, Brother Paul Lamasella's missionary class will be in there. Which I, is it open again? Okay, and it, which is open again. So, all right. So blessings to you. We'll break here and then meet over to the Thank other you. lounge. Thank you very much.